For the latest on Chenzhou 12, in Beijing studio, Xu Yansong, Director General of the Asia Pacific Space Cooperation Organization. Also in Beijing, Zhang Fan, Associate Professor of Astronomy with Beijing Normal University. Last but not least, in Washington, D.C., Dr. Amitabha Ghosh, Chair of the Science Operations Working Group for NASA Mars Exploration Rover Mission. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Congratulations to China, of course, the sixth manned space mission. Um, at the very beginning, at least, a great success. Mr. Xu, you were sitting in the studio earlier. Yes, I wake up at 4 o'clock, so I have to stay there uh, for the departure of the astronauts and all the way seeing them into space. It was a very exciting and thrilling moment, mm. and it was a very successful mission uh, so far. And we had a good, a good launch of the three astronauts into space. Of course, uh, none of them are inexperienced. They are all very experienced, even though some of them have never been on the mission itself, but been in training course. How do you see their capabilities? And what are they likely to be the main missions for this uh, exploration? Well, this uh, uh, astronaut team, there are three, three of them. Uh, one of them is a quite veteran. They're, he's 56 years old, yeah. and he's already been a, in, on the mission for twice. And another gentleman was there once, uh, and including EVA. So there's just one newcomer. So, uh, but they have already had more than 6,000 hours of training each of them, so they are quite familiar with the mission and the task in hand. Mm. Uh, this time they're quite different from the previous missions. Uh, as they are building the Chinese space station, they have to conduct a number of unprecedented maneuvers and activities, including EVA, exterior uh, vehicular uh, activity. So it's just uh, climbing out of the station and uh, basically we call it spacewalk. Yeah. Uh, but they, they, this time they're going to use the, a robotic arm to mount their feet and, and, uh, uh, and attach their tools so that they can do some more things outside of the station rather than just waving flags. So there, <laughs> may, uh, there are also segments and, and fuselage that is coming to the station for connection and rendezvous so that they, complete, they can complete the T-shaped station yeah. in, a, in a, a period of time that they can, uh, they can uh, also survive in outer space for six hours, up to six hours of e extra vehicle yes. uh, activities, and also a long-term uh, long stay of three months inside. Yes, three months uh, outer space stay. That's going to be very interesting to watch from the very beginning to the end. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, I'm sure you are watching very closely because you are working on a constant basis for the Mars Exploration Program in the United States. Uh, how do you see China's mission this time in the bigger picture? Well, in the bigger picture, um, think of this, this is a huge moment for the human race. Barely 100 years ago or 150 years ago, humans could not fly. Right now, they're not, not just flying, they, are, they have two space stations going around orbit, uh, and this is just the 21st century. Mm. And this is just the beginning. There are many more things that multiple countries and private companies have up the sleeve. So to, give, to just step back and see what this all means. You know, when you were a child or I was a child, many, many people dreamt of going to space. You know, being in a spaceship and flying through a galaxy and flying through the planets. And what we are doing here is, see, the human body and the human mind is not acclimatized to space. The human body fights with gravity every second we are on Earth. On the space station, there is none. In space, there is none. Mm. And that is a huge deal. So our muscles fail, our um, bones lose calcium. And the other thing is humans are very social creatures. And in space, it is very, very lonely. And so our mind also has to hold up. So you can think of the space station as a platform to make this happen mm. um, so that we can learn how to live in space so that we can take, take on much longer journeys yeah. to Mars and beyond. Mm. So I think overall, from the perspective of the human race, this is a huge moment. But what about cooperation or competition or even rivalry? Uh, well, that is already becoming some kinds of a reality today. Mr. Ghosh, how do you see this step in terms of that direction? So it is very uh, tough to um, evaluate that. So there will always be some geopolitics 
um, and that will preclude or encourage cooperation. But one thing, perhaps some nations like um, the United States are at a different developmental stage in space, space exploration. So for example, the International Space Station is nearing its strategic lifetime. It may be extended a little bit, but NASA is looking at the next goal, which is having a space station maybe around the moon. And the other um, big goal is to actually land um, humans on the moon mm -hmm. uh, in, in two or three years. So it is very, import very important to realize that there are very different stages. And, um, uh, but the overall prognosis is that um, each nation will go forward according to its own strategic priorities. Of course, you said that very generally. Mr. Xu, what about your take? Well, I think, uh, uh, as Amit Ghosh has mentioned, uh, that the two stations are going to operate, uh, operate in the same time. But uh, after today's launch, boom, now we have a Chinese station, a uh, yes. Chinese space station. That is uh, something that has just been done by a third country uh, in the world. Uh, uh, now we have an outpost that we can do experiments, and that it's uh, also a place that we can have international cooperations. Um, uh, we have also using the UN platform, United Nations platform, to uh, call for announcement of opportunities for nine uh, experimental payloads uh, from four, 17 countries. This mm -hmm. has been selected and confirmed, and it's going to be flying on board the Chinese mission. We also have astronauts from different nations, including European countries, that are learning Chinese and ready to go to the station uh, speaking Chinese to the astronauts. Mm -hmm. so, so there are many things ongoing. I think and the space station is, is a very first step uh, to uh, more ambitious projects like uh, uh, Boots on Moon. I, I think that was uh, a U.S. goal for 2024. Uh, but also, uh, but China, China is taking this step-by-step uh, -step approach, including uh, uh, its good economy. Uh, well, you have you have to have a sound economy to develop your good a good space program. Right. So that is what we're basing our space program on. Mm. Mr. Jiang, a professor, uh, you, of course, your, your research of uh, the general idea of astronomy. How do you see the latest step? Right, so I, I think having a space station, in particular at this stage of technological advancement, is actually quite interesting. Um, although uh, Dr. Gosh uh, mentioned that U.S. is moving on to, to greater goal, goals further away, um, the low Earth orbit is actually becoming very interesting because uh, there's something called microgravity, low gravity uh, manufacturing. So. When there's no gravity trying to pull stuff down all the time, materials behave quite differently. Just imagine trying to glue two things together and right. there's, the adhesive doesn't run uh, and splatter because of gravity. Uh, you can make pretty, just for example, pure uh, optics fibers that you can use for quantum communications. And also you can do medicine because uh, cell growth, um, for example, cancer or uh, stem cell growth behave differently in microgravity. And now with commercial sector coming up, with the launching vehicles becoming cheaper, uh, there is a real chance of actually beginning to reap profits from low Earth orbit. So having a well-established sprawling research facility, um, I, I think although it's, 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 it's later than the International Space Station, it is happening at the correct time, in my opinion. Uh, now, what is very interesting is um, how do countries look at their priorities? Uh, now I want to go to Mr. Xu about that. Now the U.S. is looking at putting boots on the moon as the priority and also its Mars program as the priority. How is China seeing its own priority? Well, I think uh, the Chinese uh, space program is developed in a in a step-by-step -step basis. Uh, we always challenge new technologies with uh, with every mission, but we also have a redundancy or backup plan for each of the mission. For example, we have a lunar mission that is a, a three-step completion, uh, what we call it orbiting, landing, and sample return missions. All of the three steps have been completed, and also we have a, a manned mission. 
that is based on our uh, capability to access to space, mm -hmm. uh, including the rocket technologies. Um, the delay of the, uh, uh, the uh, station uh, construction was uh, largely due to the uh, fault of the launch vehicle that we had a hiccup a couple of years back. But we, uh, we uh, made all the corrections and uh, everything is back on track for the Long March family, especially Long March 5, right. which is the working horse for, for putting the station uh, to, to orbit. So uh, a robotic lunar programs uh, in combination with the human uh, low Earth orbit uh, projects uh, will eventually meet up. This parallel will cross in a point where we can land a man to, to, Mar to the moon or even beyond. Mm. But one of the things people want to ask is about what about cooperation, you know? Is there any slight chance of China-U.S. cooperation? Well, I think cooperation is always very important in, in space explorations. Uh, we always say that uh, uh, alone you can go fast, but together you travel further. Uh, so with the cooperation with the uh, Russian Federation, we had a good history. Uh, uh, this can go back 50 years back. Uh, and uh, well, the space, space program from China is more largely based on the, the Russian uh, space uh, mm -hmm. capabilities and competence. Of course, after a uh, period of time, we had our own indigenous development uh, programs and projects. Uh, the cooperation with the EU and uh, European Space Agency also uh, goes back quite a long time, but that was uh, because ESA, what we call European Space Agency called ESA, is largely inclined to space science projects mm. and, and exploration projects. And they also have their own independent access to space, like uh, the Ariane 5 uh, family launch vehicle. So the, the, the cooperation with EU, uh, with ESA, was largely inclined to uh, telemetry tracking and control, mm -hmm. as well as uh, space science missions, like the Double Star programs, like the SMILE programs, and many other science missions. Uh, but the cooperation with U.S. has been, uh, it's, it's on and off. It's yes. similar to a, let's say, a, it's like a marriage. You know, you, you, sometimes you quarrel, sometimes you fight, and sometimes you get together. Uh, so the, the com uh, That's the a turbulent <laughs> marriage, one would say. <laughs> uh, but there was, uh, uh, there's, there is always an opportunity to cooperate. Even uh, in this time of uh, time frame, there's a, a uh, number of uh, bans that uh, stops us from cooperating with the U.S., a uh, number of legislations like uh, the Wolf Amendment and many others that stops the uh, agency to agency cooperation or intergovernmental cooperation. But we do have communication channels and we have multilateral forums and we have science that they can cooperate with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Mm -hmm. So many things that, that can still go between uh, China and U.S for space uh, cooperations, in particular less sensitive areas like exploration and science missions. I see. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, on that point, you want to also take it? One of the very important things is whether cooperation is required. Is there something that the U.S. needs that China has and vice versa, right? That, I think that, that also is, a, is, a, is something that um, perhaps needs, needs to be focused on. If they have different destinations, it's perhaps tougher to find a theme to collaborate on. Mm -hmm. um, second point is, uh, I think all countries have these missions which are essentially international. So, so for example, you know, United Arab Emirates launched a mission, and the collaborator was was the U.S. Um, India's first, I think, Chandrayaan mission, the Moon mission, had U.S. as a collaborator, but subsequent missions did not have U.S. as a collaborator. So this is like a, um, you know, if you think of it as like a rotating chair and different people get picked. And I don't think there is mm. that much to be read. And of course, as you men mentioned, um, there is the Wolf Amendment, which does uh, preclude certain types of collaboration. Mm. So, um, so I think the bigger news is, which is not really dwelt upon is how fast the private sector is moving. And if they are able to bring down the cost of space travel by a hundred times, as Elon Musk has exhibited, then 
we'll be talking more about the private space players than the national space players. Mm. Mr. Zhang, your take. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the commercial entities tend to, to be less ideologically inclined. And um, as we have seen already, you know, the, the, the tech competitive landscape had always been, especially before Trump, that um, a bunch of Chinese American companies working on different things, uh, going against another bunch of American and US companies. Um, so and so the, uh, the commercial entities themselves wouldn't have any obstruction, uh, uh, resistance to, to collaborating. And also the scientists and engineers involved, generally most people I talk to, um, they wouldn't have problems because nobody really wants to reinvent the wheel. If somebody else already has something working, I, I don't want to waste my time doing it all over again. And also it's quite important to have backup systems, uh, especially when you're trying to do dangerous things uh, with high chance of failure. Um, and then the, uh, the political interference, um, especially in the US, I guess commercial entities, they can manage that through lobbying and, uh, and, and, and other means. So the commercialization space, I think, will actually open up a, a new door for, uh, for collaborating. Well, I, I should we be that optimistic? I'm not sure, but uh, certainly there's a very vibrant uh, private sector involvement, both in the United States and now increasingly also in China. Uh, Mr. Xu, uh, Jeff Bezos and also Elon Musk both have demonstrated that there is tremendous interest in the outer space exploration. How is China, which stage is China's commercial outer space exploration? Well, I think uh, uh, from China we have, uh, I think one year back we have more than 140 uh, private sectors and companies that have started uh, the space uh, engineering uh, uh, startup companies. Uh, this including rocket technologies, satellite technologies, telemetry tracking and control. Not to mention uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, small companies in the applications and navigation sectors. So uh, a very booming uh, private sector uh, from China, but uh, at relatively low level mm -hmm. uh, in comparison with the state-owned enterprises. Uh, like big uh, big companies like uh, China Space Science Technology Corporation and industry corporations, uh, but they they are they are uh, fighting really hard. Uh, they're they're doing very well mm -hmm. in, in terms of uh, uh, private launch vehicles, uh, but to to catch up with international standards, they need some uh, some time and some technologies to to innovate and to 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 start with. Dr. Gosh, yes. So the U.S. situation is completely different. Think of it that the two most richest people in the world of worth $200 billion each, their life goal is to make humans an extraterrestrial civilization. They are doing it very aggressively. Elon Musk's Starship, if it happens, and there is no reason to believe that it will not, it's, it's met like 16 tri trial flights, it will revolutionize a journey to Mars. Instead of $200 billion a journey to Mars, will cost probably maybe 20 million or 200 million. It's going to be huge. So I think, and Jeff Bezos has a completely different take. He wants to set up a base on the moon. He wants to start a uh, market on the moon, mass market. See, I think one of the guests alluded to this. All this will bear fruit one day if we find a mass market in space. Mm. If somebody on the street in Washington or Beijing uses something that that is that you require from, to get it from space. And so if there is something on the moon, some mineral on the moon, or maybe a vacation on the moon that will cause tens of thousands of people to use space resources, then only this sector will open up. Mr. Zhang. NASA is a bureaucratic system as well. Dr. Gosh can either you know, back me up or, uh, or dispute me. But um, a lot of engineers, good ideas, such as the reusable rocket um, stuff, they get shot down uh, in favor of more safer, sort of more politically um, flashy projects. And obviously when Elon Musk says, we're gonna pay you a lot more money to do whatever you want to do, then uh, they get the people. Um, the difficulty with the Chinese entrepreneurs, at least from what I hear, is that the state system offers something uh, for example, uh, employment for life, uh, you know, allow your kids to go to schools that managed by this, um, by, by, by this um, uh, research institutes that are really good schools. 
um, and a lot of other benefits. So, so it's really difficult for them to get people um, to come over to their uh, to the private sector. Uh, but despite that, um, they've been making a uh, pretty admirable progress. Uh, nothing on the scale of uh, Elon Musk or, or even Jeff Bezos yet, but um, let, let's see how, how it goes. Yeah. All right. From now until three months from now, Mr. Xu, what shall we watch for? We're going to see a lot of launches for the, chain, uh, for the Tiangong uh, station. Uh, I think uh, a total of 11 launches are required. Uh, and, uh, we see a lot of education and uh, uh, education and, and spacewalk and, uh, and training programs ongoing from the station. Astronauts will be very active in communicating with the ground on video basis. And they're going to see, uh, uh, we're all going to see uh, the, the Chinese space station grow very rapidly. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. A lot of interesting information today and certainly uh, moments uh, that's making history, at least in China's men's space program. Thank you, Xu Yansong, Zhang Fan, and uh, Amitabha Ghosh. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And you're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei, still to come in the program. Called a systemic challenge at the NATO summit, a Chinese security pundit sets the record straight on China's defense policy and peaceful world. Stay tuned. The NATO has uh, three no policies toward China. That is, they do not have policy in South China Sea, they do not have policy toward Taiwan, and they do not have position on Gary Island. Thank mm -hmm. you.